as we look at these war chapters as a pattern of the war that began in heaven and a war that continues here on earth, a war that we must win, we must conquer Satan, we must prepare the world for the second coming. He is coming and we need to prepare the world for it, which means we need to conquer Satan. We must do what no other dispensation except maybe we could say Enoch, but the rest of his dispensation, the rest of the people around him certainly didn't. But we must do what Enoch did and prepare a city where there is righteousness, where Satan has been conquered. We must win this war. Therefore, as we look at these chapters as a pattern, there is within these war chapters kind of a micro lesson, a story within a story, so to speak, that I think illustrates exactly what we are supposed to do. And it's that story I want to talk about in this video. And I speak of the stripling warriors, their preservation miraculously against Lamanite warriors is very much like our preservation is going to be against the world in which we find ourselves. But we must do what they did. If we are going to be preserved like the stripling warriors were, we must be modern day stripling warriors. Now we don't know how young they were. Helaman does call them my little sons. The word stripling doesn't appear in the text. It appears in one of the chapter headings, so we don't know exactly how old they were, but how old would a my little son type warrior be? We're guessing probably mid-teens, 14, 15, maybe 16. But even at 16, can you imagine going up against the Lamanite warriors? I don't think the Lamanite warriors were in their mid-teens. I think they were massive warriors that had been seasoned and prepared, and they were strong, and there were a lot of them. And we're going to send some teenagers in to conquer them. In maybe a minor analogy, can you imagine a junior high football team or even a high school football team taking on an NFL team? What are the chances that they would survive against seasoned football players who are professionals? Teenagers would be annihilated in that game. And in a war, teenagers going up against seasoned warriors should have been annihilated. They should have been slaughtered. Every one of them should have been killed. That's what I think we all expect to have happened. And yet, they were not. After the battle was over, when Helaman numbers them, he says the following to Captain Moroni, and it came to pass that after the Lamanites had fled, I immediately gave orders that my men who had been wounded should be taken from among the dead and caused that their wounds should be dressed. And it came to pass that there were 200 out of my 2,060 who had fainted because of the loss of blood. Nevertheless, according to the goodness of God and to our great astonishment and also the joy of our whole army, there was not one soul of them who perished. Yea, and neither was there not one soul among them who had not received many wounds. Now listen to Helaman's conclusion. And I am testifying that the Book of Mormon, I believe, is including this as a testimony of our day. Now, their preservation was astonishing to our whole army. Yea, that they should be spared. Well, there was a thousand of our brethren who were slain. And we do justly ascribe it to the miraculous power of God because of their exceeding faith. Do you remember that the plan was the Lamanites had conquered one of the Nephites' fortified cities and the stripling warriors were going to run in front of them trying to lure them out and it worked. So the stripling warriors are running and out comes the Lamanite army and then Antipas and his army come up behind and then there's going to, they catch them and there's going to be a battle. So Antipas is fighting in the rear and the stripling warriors are fighting on one side. So a thousand of Antipas' men are slaughtered in that battle. A thousand in the rear. 
and yet not a single stripling warrior in the front. There's no explanation for that other than that this was a tender mercy and a miraculous intervening of heaven. So why would heaven save this army, the stripling warriors, and not spare Antipas's army, where a thousand of them slay, unless he was trying to send a message to us in the latter days? that your preservation in your battle in the latter days where your soul is at stake, not just your physical body that can be resurrected, your preservation in that spiritual battle in our day can be as miraculous as the preservation of the stripling warriors in their physical battle if you become what they were. I think that's the message The miraculous preservation of one army and not another is waving the arms and trying to say, if you do what they did, you will be as miraculously preserved in your battle. Therefore, I believe one of the great lessons from the Book of Mormon is if we become modern day stripling warriors, no matter what our age. I don't think we have to be a pre-teen or a mid-teen to become a modern-day stripling warriors. I believe 54-year-old institute teachers can become modern-day stripling warriors if we do what they did. So I invite you to become a modern-day stripling warrior, to do what they did And it is my testimony that this book is screaming out a promise to you that if you become a modern day stripling warrior, your preservation against all the forces arrayed against us today, all of Satan's hosts and everyone who fights in his cause, canceled culture and everyone out there, your preservation will be as miraculous today against all odds, as was the preservation of the stripling warriors. So the question is, what did they do? What made them modern day stripling warriors? Let me suggest three. Let me suggest three things and I'll leave you. There's others in the text that I think you could pull out, but let me emphasize three things that I believe are the beginning and the heart and soul of being a modern day stripling warrior. Number one, let's turn to where they joined the fight. Alma chapter 53, verse 16. Now you know the story. Their parents were the anti-Nephi-Lehi's who had covenanted after burying their weapons that they would not touch them again. They made an oath that they had buried their weapons of rebellion. Now, would the Lord have excused them to take up arms against the Lamanites in defense of the Nephite nation? I'm sure he probably would. But Helaman was concerned about them breaking that oath. And Helaman says, you know what? The rest of us would rather die than have you break that oath. So you hold to that oath and you don't. But that was concerning to all of us because we need the manpower. We're outnumbered and we're trying to win back our fortified cities that we lost because of our foolishness. So who's going to fight for us? Well, then there's this incredibly beautiful verse in the Book of Mormon. Alma chapter 53, verse 16. But behold, it came to pass they had many sons which had not entered into a covenant that they would not take their weapons of war to defend themselves against their enemies. Therefore, and now I think these next words are step number one. I think what happens next is the beginning of becoming a stripling warrior. This is how you initiate that. This is how you become a stripling warrior. It says in the text, they did assemble themselves together at this time, as many as were able to take up arms, and they called themselves Nephites. They did assemble themselves. It was their idea 
This is the moment they jumped in with everything they had. This is the moment Jesus became their Messiah. And this became their cause. Not mom and dad's. Now forgive me if I push this question a little bit. What have you done in this kingdom for this cause that was your idea, genuinely 100% you joining the cause? And I don't mean to diminish all the wonderful things that our adults are doing. Adults are planning wonderful activities for the youth of the church today. But I wonder, are the youth planning those activities? Are you planning your own activities? Are you all in? Have you jumped wholeheartedly into the cause? I love that phrase in 2 Nephi chapter 33. I glory in my Jesus. Is he your Jesus? Is this your cause? If everyone around you went astray and stopped attending church and stopped reading and praying, would you? I am fascinated that Jesus asked his own 12 apostles in the New Testament, whom do men say that I am? Why would he begin with that question? As if to say, do you care? Are you going to be influenced by, why, by what they think? Is your religion based on what other people's religion is. And then he asked them, who do you say that I am? And I think that's the message. Are you all in? Are you a modern day stripling warrior who has assembled yourself? I'm in. And if I'm alone, and if I'm the only one, or if I'm the only one in my family, I'm still all in. Do you remember the tree of life vision? Two groups make it to the tree, but one stays and one doesn't. The ones who leave after partaking of the fruit are the ones who looked around. And then they became ashamed. And then they left. Well, that's why I think it's so significant that number one on being a modern day stripling warrior, the first thing we read that they do is they assembled themselves together. I'm all in. I'm 100% in. Allow me to share an example from the life of young Spencer Kimball, Spencer W. Kimball, who would become the 12th president of the church, my president. He was president throughout all my primary years. I testified of Spencer W. Kimball being a prophet so many times in primary and then my youth. He died when I was 16 and it shattered my heart because I loved him with all my soul. But here is a story of, I think, an example. Either this was the day or one of the days where young Spencer became a modern day stripling warrior. He said many, many years later in General Conference about an experience he had when he was just a boy. Let me read his experience. He said, When I was a youngster, a stirring challenge came to me that moved me not a little. I cannot remember who issued the challenge nor under what circumstance it came. I remember only that it struck me like a bolt out of the blue heavens. The unknown voice postulated, quote, the Mormon church has stood its ground for the first two generations, but wait till the third and fourth and succeeding generations come along. The first generation fired with a new religion developed a great enthusiasm for it. Surrounded with bitterness, calumny of a hostile world, persecuted from pillar to post, they were forced to huddle together for survival. There was good reason to expect they would live and die faithful to their espoused cause. The second generation came along born to enthusiasts, zealots, devotees. They were born to men and women who had developed great faith, were used to hardships and sacrifices for their faith. They inherited from their parents and soaked up from religious homes the stuff of which the faithful were made. 
they had full reservoirs of strength and faith upon which to draw. And then President Kimball heard that voice say the following, but wait until the third and fourth generations come along, said the cynical voice. The fire will have gone out. The devotion will have diluted. The sacrifice will have been nullified. The world will have hovered over them and surrounded them and eroded them. The faith will have been expended and the religious fervor leaked out. Now think about what's happening in our day. Look around you and tell me that isn't a pretty accurate description of people whose families have been in the church for many generations and yet the fire has faded. It has eroded. It has simply become something that they take for granted and they cast aside callously. That is exactly what has happened and is exactly happening what is, that is exactly what is happening all around us. Now, President Kimball heard that and said the following to himself. That day, I realized that I was a member of the third generation. It had been Heber C. Kimball, Andrew Kimball, his father, Spencer W. Kimball. That day, I realized I was a member of the third generation. Now watch him become a modern day stripling warrior. That day, I clenched my growing fists. I gritted my teeth and made a firm commitment to myself that here was one third generation who would not fulfill that dire prediction. That day, Spencer Kimball gathered himself to the cause. I'm all in. This is my cause and I'm going to fight with all that I have. He assembled himself. And that I believe is step number one. And I would invite you to ask yourself, where are you? Are you standing on the ledge wondering if you should jump in? Is it still mom and dad's church? Is it that you're, you're, you're going to the activities that you're invited to and yet you're still not fully engaged yourself? I would invite you today to draw a line in the sand and say, I'm in. I'm in. No matter who is and isn't, I'm in. And you grab spiritually that weapon, spiritual weapon, and you go fight the enemy. I am in. I jump wholeheartedly. And if you stop inviting me, if you stop holding classes and inviting me to come, I am going to take it upon myself to educate myself. That, I believe, is step number one. The day you join the cause, you, you join the cause and become a modern day stripling warrior. Let me illustrate that using the life of Peter. When Jesus preached the sermon on the bread of life, it was a real test for a lot of people. Many of the Jews expected a king that would conquer Rome and they would become an independent nation again, and put a king on the throne, a Jewish king. What they lost when the Babylonians came in and ended the kingdom, they wanted back. And many of them thought Jesus was that king and some of them wanted to force him and crown him king. Instead, he preached the, the Sermon on the Bread of Life. And he basically said, I am not going to do that. I am not going to do what you expect me to do. I am not going to march on Rome. Instead, I'm here to conquer sin and death. That's the enemy I'm going to conquer. And in John chapter 6, it says, Many therefore of his disciples, when they heard this, said, This is an hard saying. Who can hear it? Now, those hard moments are coming, and that's why I think being a stripling warrior and saying, I'm all in, is critical. When those hard moments come, stripling warriors don't walk away. They're all in, even when it's hard. But many of the disciples, when they heard it, said, this is an hard saying. Who can hear it? Now, look at verse 66. 
from that time, many of his disciples went back. Many of his disciples, these were curious people who were watching. These were his disciples. Many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Now, here's the defining moment, I think, of his tripling warrior. When things are hard, this is why I think it's so critical to jump in and say, I'm in. I'm in. I give myself to this cause. I choose to jump in with both feet because Jesus turns to Peter and says, and all the 12, and says, will you also go away? Will you go away when it's inconvenient or when it's hard? Will you go away when God doesn't answer your prayers the way you thought he should? Will you also go away? And then I just love what Peter says. I think this is the epitome of a modern day stripling warrior. Peter says, Lord, to whom would we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. We believe and are sure that thou art that Christ, the Son of the living God. That's why I think that number one is so critical. It's the moment we say, I'm in. I'm all in. I choose. It's the day we clench our fist and say, this one will not leave. I will not walk away, even when it's hard. So there's number one. Now, let me give you a number two. There's no way we can just have a whole bunch of young warriors who are eager and willing to fight just go run into the battle. There's no way that will work out very well. So if these stripling warriors just say, hey, I'm in, and they grab a sword and they run to the battle, it's not going to happen. They need a leader. And every single one of us has to make this critical choice. Who is your leader? Who do you follow? Who do you emulate? Whose life is worthy of you emulating? Some people in this generation choose famous people, athletes. Some young men want to imitate the life of an athlete. Now, I'm not necessarily saying that's a bad thing, but everyone has to choose who their leader is. Some people choose this person and some people choose that person. So now the stripling warriors have to choose. They need a leader. Now, number two on our list, what makes you a stripling warrior is when you choose what they chose. Now, let me just kind of set this up. This is a military scene, and it would have made sense to choose a military leader. It would have made sense to choose someone like Captain Moroni, or Tiancum, or Lehi, or Antipas. So many wonderful leaders, so many wonderful warrior leaders. And it would have made sense to choose one of them because I'm going into battle and I need a military strategic mind. But that is not who they chose. If you want to be preserved miraculously in this fight, you need to choose a different leader. And I love that Helaman got to that moment where he didn't know militarily what to do. Do you remember the whole strategy was that the, the Lamanites are held up in a fortified Nephite city that the Nephites lost because of their foolishness? And the idea was that the stripling warriors were going to pass in front of the city and the Lamanites would come out and then Antipas would come up behind and they'd kind of sandwich the Lamanites. Now, as they're running from the Lamanite, it worked because the Lamanites come out of the city. As they're running from the Lamanites, the Lamanites stop. And the stripling warriors don't know, is it a trap? Have they figured out what our strategy is and they're waiting for us to turn around so we, they can slaughter us and then they'll focus on Antipas? Or has Antipas caught up with them? And here comes a moment for a brilliant military mind to have a strategy. And do you remember what Helaman says? What do you guys want to do in this critical moment? So I think it's safe to say that Helaman wasn't chosen because he has this brilliant military mind. So why did the stripling warriors, among all the people they could have set up as their leader, 
So why do we find in verse 19 of Alma chapter 53 this verse? They would that Helaman should be their leader. Why would they? Why is it that they would that Helaman of all people should be their leader? I don't think he was a brilliant military mind. That's not why they chose him. They wanted Helaman because he was a prophet. I believe number two in becoming a modern day stripling warrior is that moment you say, I choose, I would that the prophet of God is my leader. I would that Russell M. Nelson is my leader. I choose him as my leader. Now, what I love is to point out that wasn't just an arbitrary choice. That was a, that was a heart choice. I love that in chapter 56, first, what's the relationship between Helaman and them? I love these little verses like verse 10, my 2000 sons. Verse 17, those sons of mine. Verse 27, my 2000 sons. Verse 30, my little sons. Verse 39, my little sons. Verse 44, my sons. Clearly, the relationship from Helaman to Stripling Warrior was a father-child relationship. Now, how about the other way? What do they call him in verse 46 in that critical moment? What say you, my sons? They respond, Father. So it's more than just choosing the prophet. It's more than just simply saying, okay, I will follow Russell Nelson. It's saying, I will create that intimate father, parent, child relationship. I will follow Russell Nelson like a child follows a parent. That's the connection. I choose to be child to the parent in this relationship. And the prophet is like my father. And I'm going to have that type of relationship. I don't think it matters how old you are. I think a 54 year old man can say in his heart, I choose to follow Russell Nelson like a child follows and trusts a parent. Think about that loving relationship between parent and child. Think of the trust that children have for parents and how they seek them out in times of trouble. I believe that is the request here. I think that's the idea. That's what's going to be the preservation. When I have that type of relationship with the prophet of my day, when I trust the prophet like a child trusts a parent, when I yearn to be with my parent, when I fall down and I skin my knee, who do I run to? Where do I run? Whose words do I run to when I'm in pain? I run to the Lord's representative in my day. And I think we could personify scripture. Maybe it's past prophet. I have that same relationship with past prophets. I look at them as a child looks upon a parent. I love the Book of Mormon. I love the writings of Book of Mormon prophets. And I seek them out like a child seeks out a parent in a moment of fear and anxiety. And that's, I think, number two. Number one, I'm all in. And number two, I would that the Lord through his prophets be my leader whether that be current prophet or past prophets or even the whisperings of the spirit within me the relationship i have is i would that the prophet the lord's servants and the whisperings of the holy ghost they are my leaders i choose and i would that they lead me there's number two now, if you do choose to be led by prophets, seers, and revelators, 
and you have that relationship as a child towards a parent, then this next one would be easy. But I find it fascinating that their preservation is mentioned in the same chapter that says the following verse. They did obey and observe to perform every word of command with exactness. Now, I believe there's room for being human and making mistakes and repenting. I don't think that's what the Book of Mormon is emphasizing as much as if my goal is when my prophet speaks or when a past prophet in the scriptures speaks, I'm going to do everything in my power to obey with exactness. I believe that the preservation comes with that obedience. It's choosing a prophet and choosing to be as exact in my obedience as I can. Again, I believe there's, an, there's, re, there's room for humanness here. The Book of Mormon is very clear that there is room for humanness. But the goal in my heart should be, I want to do everything that he says. I want to do everything that Nephi taught me or that Alma taught me. I want to do everything that the Holy Ghost whispers to me to do. Like a child would follow the instructions of a loving parent. I want to obey with exactness. If we do that, I believe the Book of Mormon is screaming out to us that our preservation in our war, in this spiritual war trying to consume us, will be as miraculous as the stripling warriors' preservation was in their war. They should have been slaughtered by those Lamanite warriors. Why was it that Antipas' army was slaughtered? A thousand men died in that battle but not one of Helaman's warriors died. That miraculous preservation seems to be saying, in our battle against our foe, if you jump in and assemble yourself together and choose to be all in, and then choose or would that the prophet be your leader, that living prophets, and scripture prophets, and inspired prophets, and, and Holy Ghost, when I would, that those are the voices that I follow. That is who leads me. And then my goal is to obey with exactness everything that they say, every, and to follow like that child follows a parent. It is my solemn testimony that your preservation in the war against Satan will be as miraculous. That is what I hear the Book of Mormon saying. That is the testimony I hear when I read these chapters. We can and we must win this war. We must remove Satan from this earth. And according to the Book of Mormon, we do that by removing Satan from our hearts. We must win this war. We must be modern day stripling warriors. We can do this. We can be victorious. We were once in pre-mortal life and we can win again, but we gotta be all in, even when it's hard, even when others walk away, we have to be that one that says to the Lord, where would I go? I'm all in, even when it's hard. We have to choose to follow prophetic direction and we need to give as strict heed as we possibly can to those instructions. I leave you with my testimony. I believe this story is in the Book of Mormon to illustrate the miraculous preservation that will be ours when we do what they did. May we be modern day stripling warriors is my prayer in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.